University in the Graduate Liberal Studies program. And my professor was Marion Bellinger, who got her, she's a wonderful photographer here in Connecticut, who went to Yale and got her MFA from Yale and is in museums all over the world. Um, the point of this uh, class was we each had to pick a state park and we had to go there on our own and document the state park. And then we would come back together and create a project together. So it would be a class project. So I chose the Quinnipiac River State Park, and then I made a book, and then with the rest of the class, we made this small packet of postcards with um, all of, each of us got two cards that we could put our photographs on, and this is now in the collection at Wesleyan. So why the Quinnipiac River State Park? And it's really a very mundane reason. It was right off the Wilbur Cross on my way to Wesleyan. And I thought, well, that's easy. I mean, I can stop going to or from class. And uh, because it was still September, so I would be getting back in time. I could do some photography. So I tried to figure out how to get to it. And it turns out that you have to get off at the rest stop between exit 63 and 64, find your way behind the rest stop, and look for this sign that tells you that you're at the Quinnipiac River State Park. This is what the entrance looks like. It's got this barrier across so people can't drive on. And the first thing I noticed was this blacktop pathway. And it was wider than a regular path, not quite as wide as, wide as a street, but it just went continuously straight. And I thought this is a very odd way to enter a park. Maybe it will end and then become park-like, but it didn't. It just kept going and going and going. I think over the three-month period that I was doing this, I took probably about 1,500 photographs. Uh, I just kept going back and trying to notice things that I hadn't seen before. So at this point, I'm really focused on the way that the the walkway just goes straight. It does not veer until you get to certain parts. It goes off a little bit. Uh, I also noticed that there were areas that looked like they'd been cleared. And I couldn't imagine why those areas had been cleared. I thought this is, a, it really had a feeling of a, a park setting, a little mini park setting, or that somebody had intentionally made it look like that. Oh, uh, here's another one. So as walking along the path, you would suddenly come across one of these kind of areas. Um, then I started noticing things like English ivy and little old 19, from the 1950s, probably little old metal garden railings that were here and there. And then that stone wall that's back there. And that added to the mystery of what was going on here. Then I found um, a back step, a cement step that you could see in the far side on the right, you can actually see bricks. So this was probably attached to a brick wall of some sort. Why was that there? Another, we've suddenly started to see foundations. As I would veer off and walk through the woods, I would find these things. Like here's the other side of that foundation. What was that doing there, cement block foundation? And then I saw along the river this gated area, but the gate was no longer there, but it was a way to get down to the river. And I, it felt like a boat launch of some sort, but I wasn't sure. So at this point, I just saw too many things that I were clues to something going on and I wanted to know more. So I went to the Connecticut State Library to do some research, the North Haven Historical Society, the North Haven Town Hall, and I even went to the TV station in North Haven to find out anything I could. And what I did find out was that there had been terrible flooding for many, many years in this area, starting in the 30s when houses were first built there. And so I wanted to know more about it. I kept looking at different things and I found this from Town Hall where there had been a plan in 27 and 29 to build Overbrook camps. Now this is an area that might be a mile by three quarters of a mile and they were planning on putting in 500 mm. spots in there. I mean, it was an outrageous plan. I don't know what they were gonna put there, whether they're gonna be just 
tent platforms or what, but that really got me going. So I started looking for more photographs of older photographs of the area, and I found this aerial photograph from 1934. At this point, they had built 50 summer cottages, and you can see the river is the kind of twisty thing. And then Upper State Street is that road that you see on the left, and all the little roads in between are part of this community where I've been walking. And that's why they're all, there's all this blacktop that's going in straight lines because they were actually streets and driveways. There at one time was the Overbrook Beach right there on the, on the Quinnipiac River, and it was known as Little Savin Rock. And I met a man at the North Haven Historical Society who was about 85, I think, at that time. And he remembers as a child getting on a bus to come out to Little Savin Rock for the afternoon to go swimming where they had a bathhouse and a snack bar and all that stuff. And it, it was so odd to me because looking at the river as it is now, you would never think that anybody would go in that river. But here's 1965 aerial map, and I've overlaid it with the plan of the housing area. You can see now the Wilbur Cross is now in this picture. And it's between the river and Old uh, State Street. And when they built the Wilbur Cross, they of course had to raise the ground a little bit. So this sort of created a berm that kept the water in this area if the river did overflow, which of course it did often. Um, now this is now back to the up to the 1970s and you can see the Wilbur Cross. Now you can see I-91 has now been built. And there at the bottom, the line that goes across both 95 and the Wil 91 and the Wilbur Cross is Route 22, which is the bridge going over to Route 5. So they basically created a bowl effect right here. I'm doing Zoom, Jeff. Yeah, so that you would not be yep. able, if it, if it started to flood, yeah. there's no place for that water to go at all. So these are pictures from the 30s of flooding in that area when they were smaller houses. And everything that's written on the back of each one of these, I typed underneath it. So the, the, that was all handwritten on there. There were people, I mean, you can imagine this would have been in your family's photo album of, you know, when grandmother's house uh, flooded. And then these are articles from the 1970s about that last flood. This was the flood that just pushed everybody over the, the edge. Mm -hmm. And this is when Senator uh, Donardis came in and said, I'm going to fix this for you people. This can't be. And when I was first reading about this, I thought what had happened is that the state came in like big government and said, you guys can't stay here anymore. We're kicking you out. You have to go. But in reality, what it was is he went in and got the funding so that these people could buy a house or the house would be bought for them by the state of equal value to the homes that they had, equal uh, real estate value. So it was, it was a saving of their lives. They just couldn't keep going on like this. They were losing everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then the great stuff from the, New, from the New Haven TV is this wonderful film. It's called A Walk Through North Haven, Banton Street Remembered. And you can see these people were, you know, the kids were swimming in the river. The people, that one below, it's another one of the shots from flooding. But, you know, it's like Uncle Harold's there, you know, standing there on the porch. It's all very friendly family community kind of feel. And I also put up this list of people who lived there at the time. And Frank Polano, his son started a company called Banton Construction Company. And he named it after Banton Street because he was so happy there as a kid. He loved it. Um, and then the recovery project, it went faster than any other recovery pro project ever. Denardis really pushed this through quickly and people were very thankful. And so now the park is used for recreation, such as hunting and walking your dogs and bicycling and just hiking. You're, nobody, I think, uses the river for anything except canoeing or kayaking. But if you ever do go here, 
in the, in the fall, make sure that you wear something very bright because these hunters are here. They can do this kind of hunting, I think, from September through January. Mm. And then uh, hunting with guns is more close to Thanksgiving time. Well, but, well uh, uh, hunting uh, 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 regulations are you can have bow hunting for a particular period of time, and then you can have um, a right, uh, you can have shotgun hunting and then rifle hunting. You know, and yeah. they are all separated. Uh, yes. These are obviously bow hunters probably go, going for deer. They were, and they, they have those things that they go up into the trees and sit they there have, waiting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I have just one quick other thing. I just want to show you that book that I wrote. If you, if you can uh, bear with me one more moment, um, I'm just going to read from the book. It's Quinnipiac River State Park is an anomaly, a Connecticut state park with an unusual past. As late as 1976, it was Banton Street, a community of 40 homes along a winding, lazy river. By the 60s and 70s, due to overbuilding and poor highway engineering, Banton Street was experiencing frequent severe flooding. To address this dangerous situation, the Quinnipiac River Restoration Project was formed by Connecticut State Lawrence, Senator Lawrence Donardis. Its goal was to help Banton Street homeowners relocate from this floodplain to homes of equal value in North Haven. Authorities were aware and saddened that this also meant forcing Banton Street residents to abandon their close-knit riparian neighborhood. Presently, the Banton Street entrance to the park is tucked behind a rest stop off Wilbercross Parkway, another reminder that this park had an unusual beginning. Within the park are many clues to the whereabouts of lost homes and past lives, rusty twisted fences, pavement hidden by creeping vines and objects left to decay. Spending time on this land is a spiritual experience. This is a living, breathing space that has transformed itself from manicured lawns to wilderness. Ever changing, each visit offers new discoveries and more clues to the past and a rare opportunity to witness nature's power to renew. And then I just would love to be able to just show you um, the pages from the book, and I, I won't have anything more to say. I'm just going to go through them quickly. That's what I just read you there. Mm. Oh, one more thing. The numbers at the bottom, I used GPS to indicate on uh, Google Earth where each of these photographs was taken. You know, I lived in North Haven for 40 odd years, and I never knew that there was this, this park existed. <laughs> I know. I know, isn't it funny? It's just nestled in there. Right. Um, the way it began was the leftover land that was purchased to make the Wilbur Cross Parkway, what the state turned into Quinnipiac River State Park, but it didn't include this. And then when this happened, they added it to the park. Uh -huh. And this is a, you know, this was a metal box. I mean, it was fascinating to just walk along and find these objects. Another thing too, the if you all remember when you had to put a thing around your tree for the gypsy moth caterpillars, mm -hmm. that's what that is there, that line on the tree. That was another clue that something was up. Uh, and then the last, and then there are other clue too, there would be these pipes that would empty into the river, which, uh. you know, it's not, would not happen anymore, but it certainly happened then. All right, well, thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Does anybody have any questions? So how, how big is the park in acreage now? Um, the area that I did was 1.2 miles long, and I don't know how wide. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that question. It's, it goes to Tolls Road. Okay. Um, okay. And I'm not really that familiar with Tolls Road. And they're hoping, though, to connect this to be able to walk all the way through to Tolls Road. Right. Well, actually, uh, if you go up Old Hartford Turnpike, um, you uh, just before you get to Wallingford, that's where Tolls Road is, and Tolls Road goes down, and and uh, and you have the entrance to I ninety one, and 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 Route five. Uh, I just uh, it's just it's just a mystery to me that I didn't know anything about this. You know, I'm a fisherman, and I've never really fished the Quinnipiac. I fished the Mill River um, uh, uh, here. Um, and uh, and you know I've seen deer even down um, 
off Skip Street at times, and I wondered where they would be coming, and I realized that they would, might be coming down the, uh, the, uh, the, the Mill River, but maybe, maybe they were also coming down the, the Quinnipiac. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, well, it's funny, too, and I was there recently. I took some more photos about a month ago, and I'd suddenly, as I was about 30 minutes into my walk, I started worrying about bears. I thought, you know, we had a bear in Westville. Maybe there'd be a bear here, too. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lonely place. There are not many people around. And so it's, it's fascinating and a little nerve-wracking at the same time. But it's really a wonderful place to walk. So I'd encourage everybody to go to it and just get off the rest stop. Susan, is your book available? This is Linda. Oh, hi, Linda. Yes, I have about 10 copies now, but I can get more if I needed them. Yes, definitely. I'd love to get a copy. Okay, I would love to get one to, for you. I'll email you and, okay. and figure out how to get it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I will turn off my sharing. Okay. Thank you so much, Susan. You're welcome. Um. So Solomon is up for his presentation. Um, Greg, did you want to introduce him? Oh, let me unmute you because I think you're talking. <laughs> Need a little bit more volume. Greg is is muted. Oh, Greg. Okay. You, okay. Oh yeah. All right. We're all good. I think I'm unmuted now. Many residents of Connecticut know Solomon Maple. His music uh, his, his, receives glowing reports of, uh, of his talent in both local and national reviews of jazz music. He's one of a kind, according to many music reviews. He's well known throughout Connecticut for his African American music. We are fortunate to have him perform today, this evening. Solomon, it's all yours. Solomon, just make sure you're on. Okay, there you go. Gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> make sure you can see me. Can you see? Can you see? Uh, you can see me well. Yep. Yes. Okay. You can hear. You can hear me. Okay. Yes. Yes. yes.
That was wonderful. It's unfortunate, however, that uh, you, we didn't uh, uh, find out how to uh, bring in the enhanced uh, Zoom uh, audio. Uh, they, they, uh, Yale got Zoom to um, uh, have a high fidelity audio uh, because of all of, the, all of their te teaching away from, from the studio. And it really made a difference. I just I, I just heard a an exa a, uh, an example of that, and it was really particularly for the piano. The the overtones were clearer and everything. Thank you so much. That, was, that really was great. And uh, unfortunately, we should have found found out how to make you better. <laughs> <laughs> how to make me sound better. Sound better, right? It was beautiful. I loved it. Princess has a baby. Yes, I have a baby and he's still sleeping, so. <laughs> yes, I have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's falling deeper and deeper into sleep. That's right. I had a question for you, Solomon. Um, was that something that you pre-recorded or was that a freestyle for us? And where do you find your inspiration at a time like this when we're facing a pandemic? This was never was never um, pre-recorded. It, it was a freestyle. It, um, you know, as as it uh, was written, um, I um, a lot of the music that I do is is inspiration from what comes in my mind and my heart. And when it comes, I, I just you know, kind of go, like flow with it as it as it comes. Mm. Um, and a lot of it, a, a lot of it is music that um, that was just at the moment I was feeling, and and I just. Started, you know, I had just went went with it, mm. and um, and every time every time I play it, sometimes something you know something more becomes added. You know, I, I always I'm always adding more to it every time. So like, you know, one one time you know I'll play this, but then another time I may switch up and play that particular piece of music that I just did, but then add something else to it that is a, a whole different uh, twist. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like, like just a comment. It's, it was so peaceful. I know why you were saying about uh, the baby sleeping. It was just beautifully peaceful and yet um, uplifting. The, the key that you're in or something, I, I don't play any instruments, so I don't know how to say that, but the, where the keys, the, the lightness of it, it was beautiful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, the sound is always a problem with uh, with uh, uh, Zoom. But for our first foray, uh, you did very well, and we appreciate it very, very much. Well, Zoom just did this for Yale during the pandemic. Uh, yeah, a bit for, uh, for their teaching because they were doing so much remote teaching, uh, and uh, and it was it was difficult for students and uh, and their professors to really communicate what was going on, and and uh, so they uh, Yale is has enough pull to do things, and so <laughs> they contacted Zoom and they asked if Zoom could. 
uh, put a high fidelity uh, 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 high fidelity program in Zoom for better better uh, 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 listening of, of music, better clar clarity of music. And, and apparently Zoom came up with it and they have been using it, I guess, during the pandemic. And as I, as I said, I, I heard one example of the difference between default, which is where uh, Solomon was, was, uh, was playing in, in a default uh, uh, way and in this uh, high fidelity way. And, and, and the differences were subtle, but, they, but the, the notes was crisp. Yeah. Particularly, uh, particularly with your right hand when you're up at the top of the of the keyboard. There, you know, the, those those to those notes are so sharp, and 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 what when what uh, uh, what the zooms of efficiency really made them clear. You know, I think with on a, on your left hand when you're when you're in the lower keys, you know, they they actually uh, like to have a little. Overtone, and you can, and where where they actually the lower keys actually uh, make the other keys sing, uh, whereas up on the upper keys, you know, you you're you're really uh, looking for sharpness, and 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 but on the other hand, I, I enjoyed it. It was wonderful, mm. and, and I think um, I think what you said about what, whether this was written or recorded and is, is that's the essence of a jazz musician. It comes from you and it comes from your heart and from your, uh, just from the, the time that you're, you're thinking about something. That was great. I mean, uh, this keyboard, uh, I'm sorry. to say, but this keyboard is not even a, 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 a upscale keyboard. It's kind of a lower end keyboard. But, <laughs> You know the, the 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 thing about it is is that you know I I truly believe that it's not the it's not the instrument um, that makes you know the the musician the musician is really from within you know it you know this is just a a, a mere tool that you know is being used to um, bring it out you know so I, I I'm I'm just amazed that this that you can you know you was able to hear the sound. You know, at, a, at, a, at a good quality, decent quality, and you know, and it was, uh, it, you know, sounded okay because, you know, I, I, I wasn't going to go into any other, any other sounds on it. I was, I was trying to, trying to keep it as, um, <laughs> keep it as just one main and, and see how it, how it, uh, how it resonates. You know, how y'all can hear it because um, I could have went into a whole, a whole lot of other sounds and even did beats. I just wanted it to to resonate enough to where you can appreciate. Right. Oh, that's nice. You know, while, since you're on the piano right now and we have your attention, um, it is, um, oh, you know, our president, which he will always be the president here, it's birthday today. And I was wondering maybe if you could put a little sound of birthday music on for Dr. Gregory Tignor. You know, just, I don't know if everybody knows, but it is his birthday. Greg, you're the only one. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Greg. Happy birthday, Greg. Happy birthday, Greg. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Greg. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank 
Greg, I'm going to steal this one because I have um, had the pleasure of working with Karina for three years at the Ethel Walker School. So I'd like to do the honor in introducing her. Um, you'll, does, does everyone see her profile here and her picture? Yep. Mm -hmm. right, so, so Karina, you ready? Um, Karina is a Venezuelan American artist and she was born in Valencia, Venezuela. She studied at Choate Rosemary Hall in Connecticut and had a formal training with her Venezuelan painter and sculptor Luis Alvarez de Lugo. She earned her BFA in studio art with honors and distinction from Albertus Magnus College in New Haven while raising her three children. She is currently a, Les a Leslie Art and Design MFA and Visual Arts and Candidate at Leslie University in Cambridge, Massachusetts with a Stosh Moffe Merit Scholarship. Did I screw that up? <laughs> Working in different media and techniques, her artwork has, shown, has been shown in galleries and museums in South America, the Caribbean, and the United States, including the prestigious Salma Gundi Club in New York City. Karina's work has been featured on Spotlight on the Arts, on the Connecticut Public Television Peace nomination for an Emmy Award. She has won awards from major organizations in the United States, as well as an artist in residency at the Vermont Studio Center with a merit-based grant. She was also a 2019 artist in residency at RUC, which is residency for contemporary artists in the Italian Alps. Um, her work is a public in public collections in the United States. Um, without further ado, Karina, you ready to show those masks that you made? I am. Right, Should I put my back prone? Let's see. Oh, I don't know what happened to my back prone. So they, they left me. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know where they went. Um, I had my back prone with all the, the masks that I used during my last residency in grad school. Um, I'm in a low residency program, so we meet every six months. We get together for 10 days. And unfortunately, this time we had to do it online. So I had my mask behind me. But well, I don't know what happened. They disappeared. <laughs> what a preference is, Karina? And then you go to your um, background. Was it a virtual background? I was trying, but the, it, it's not there. I don't know where it went. Okay. Well, yeah. The art, the yeah. art behind you is beautiful all the more. Thank you. That's Caribbean. That's from from Haiti. <laughs> yeah, um, it's my inspiration piece. So I'm going to share my website. Let's see. So here is my series. So I'm going to start talking about um, you know, when quarantine started, I was starting my fourth semester, no, my third semester in, in grad school. And I had to produce work for my fourth residency. And then the pandemic hit us and I couldn't use my shared studio space. And I was just in the apartment. I didn't know what to do and trying to deal with students that were, oh, I work at the Ethel Walker School as, as princess said and I'm a I'm a dorm parent so I live in an apartment within a dorm so we were having students here from China who couldn't fly home so dealing with all of this while trying to also produce artwork for grad school was very challenging mm -hmm. um, the work that was that I was producing before um, I was using traditionally considered female crafts as my way of waving to my stories my stories of childhood my kids being raised in a different culture. Um, Venezuelan culture is more collective and, and the United States is more individualistic. So that shock in culture was a, especially evident when raising children, right? Because we usually try to imitate our parents, even though we hate them when we're growing up, then we become them, right? <laughs> so that was, for me, was very challenging. Um, they're all grown up now. And, and so I was trying to go back to all of that and, and produce a work that had to do with growing up in a patriarchal society and how the women are the glue that hold these families together and how 
traditions get passed down through the crafts, right? Through the cooking, through the making of crafts for their homes. And so that was my work about. Then the pandemic came and I didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden I said, well, everybody's asking us to wear masks. And how about if I use the mask as my, my mean to tell my message? So I decided to teach myself how to crochet, which I didn't know. But instead of crocheting with traditional threads, I was using rope and wire and raffia and leather remnants and the bags from the first pers person who did grocery shopping for me. Um, and as you can see, they, they started growing. And this was from wow. the box, from one of the boxes I wow. received. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> this is incredible. This is, this is the kitchen twine. And then th this was a, um, a beach ball that I had in a, that had a glove imprinted. And they were saying on the media how we're in this together, we're in this together. So I, I cut it out in a spiral form to get a string. And then I whipped, I crocheted the whole uh, plastic uh, ball. And, and I kept going and then the president said that, um, how about injecting people with oh. disinfectant? <laughs> so I created the caution tape one because I felt, well, well we better tell people not to do that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I, I used remnants from another project I did about Venezuela and I did the Venezuelan flag, but in the blue, I added the stars of the United States, so kind of like symbolizing my dual citizenship. And, and then people were going out and about and don't caring about staying home. So I made this with googly eyes and telling, you know, I can see you. <laughs> and, and then here we are, you know, gaining weight as we are in our homes, uh, isolated. And so I did this one with tape measures, you know, this measuring tapes for, <laughs> for um, when you're a mistress, that's a seamstress, not a mistress, a seamstress. No. <laughs> um, and then I went to snakes because that's how I was feeling. And then people were talking about how the, you know, the, the um, domestic violence had been raised since people were at home. So that was something that was worrying me. So I, I made this mask. And then I created the most logical like when people were saying not to touch your mask because your masks are going to have the virus on it. So I created this one. This one is actually was bought by the New Haven Museum. So you can go and look at it there. They have it now. And then, of course, I felt like in prison. So I use this rusted nails on a crochet, a copper wired a piece. Um, mm. Then I was thinking about how spring was really, we lost spring, right? So I made this one out of springs, mm -hmm. uh, just thinking about that lost and, and how I wish I could be gardening. So I did this with all the seeds from melons and, and I forgot what's the other one that I was using um, from things that I was eating. And this to me was more like, you know, when you go to, when you die, you're, you're down earth and the worms are eating you. That's pretty much how I was feeling at that point. Boy. So um, when I got there, my hands started to, I started having problems with my, my thumbs because of the heaviness of the, some of the materials I was working with. And so I had to start uh, changing the crocheting to materials that were a little bit more easy for me to do while my hands recuperated. So I kept saving all the elastic bags we would get in our mail. And, and then I just used, this is just uh, those metal uh, sponges that you use in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So that was very easy to make that one. And this I had crocheted before I started with the paint in my hands. So I just decorated it while I was in paint. And so all of this were done trying to keep working on the project Karina, while recuperating I have, my hands. I have a question. I'm sorry? Toilet paper? Yes. 
Oh, there's so yes, much. Yes, the toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This one I wanted to make since the beginning, but I had to use the toilet, the toilet paper so I could have the rolls, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it took me a little longer. And then of course, filling fans in and, and I kept going and going and that's like nesting. And before the pandemic, my project was dipping tea bags into plaster. And I was gonna create a big installation of hanging all those plaster uh, fill bags from the ceiling um, because tea in Venezuela is used for healing purposes. Like we never sit down and have tea. We have coffee, but we don't have tea. Tea when you're sick, then then that's when you take that's when you drink tea. So it it meant like the healing, the repairing of the soul. Um, so I decided to use some of those tea bags that I had already dipped that I couldn't keep dipping and into a mass. That's actually very heavy mass. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is that as I made the mass, I would uh, put them on, take a, a picture, a selfie uh, with my mask on, a, a frontal picture, a side picture, and a picture of the mask on the table. And I immediately posted on Instagram. So it became this performative piece. And at the same time, one of the things I was complaining about is that I was feeling that because everybody's so individualistic in this country, I didn't feel a sense of community, that I was missing that big community from, from my country. And it turned out that by doing this project, all of a sudden I have all these people that were waiting for my mask to come out and they were waiting to comment about it. And then all of a sudden, people started sending me materials. So um, this one I made with the last events that people, that somebody sent me. They're tiny little last events that somebody sent me. This was from a leather jacket that a friend of mine sent me. She said, just cut it up and do something with it. So I did that mask. Then this one also was a, a fur coat that I got also as a gift. And, and then I just added the pom-poms for fun. So now this project has become this great community where people are starting to send me materials for me to make more masks with, which I find it very exciting. So at the same time that I'm, I'm narrating how I feel, um, this was flag day. Um, I'm, and I'm narrating, uh, I'm, I'm indexing my time in isolation through the things I have consumed or the stories that I have heard or things that have um, impacted me, uh, you know, internally. And I wanted to talk about it, but it's also a way of people uh, taking part of this project, which is to me what I find the the greatest gift that i was i wasn't really looking forward to you know it was something that just came out of the project itself um there are two quotes that i want to read uh, that i was reading as i was working this work one of the my readings was the, po the poetics of space i had read it before but i started reading about it because he talks about all the different spaces within a home and, and this quote really caught my attention. Uh, because being an introvert myself, being in isolation is not necessarily a negative thing, right? Uh, of course, it's, it's, it's mentally, mentally challenging, especially if you can go outside and be with, it, with nature. Um, but it's not, that, it's not that bad for somebody who's an introvert that doesn't really need to be out there with other people all the time. Um, so I found that um, this quote really um, represented how I was feeling. Said, what a refugee for ambivalence. Here is a dreamer who is happy to be sad, content to be alone, waiting. In this corner, she can meditate upon life and death. And I thought, what a perfect quote for <laughs> the way I was feeling. And I want to end with another quote uh, by Pablo Neruda. Um, There's no insurmountable solitude. All paths lead to the same goal, to convey to others what we are. And we must pass through solitude and difficulty. 
isolation and silence in order to reach forth to the enchanted place where we can dance our clumsy dance and sing our sorrowful song. But in this dance or in this song, they are fulfilled the most ancient rites of our conscious in the awareness of being human and of believing in a common destiny. Thank you so much, Karina. Karina, they are wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Have questions, Karina? Yes. Well, I I have a I don't have a question. Well, I do have a couple of questions, but I wanted to say that watching these appear on Instagram was so delightful. It was just wonderful. And the the way you photographed yourself exactly the same each time was I I love um groups of work like that. It's wonderful. But my question is now where do you have them? Where are you? Because some of those look so fragile. How are you taking well, care right of Right now, they are right behind the computer mm -hmm. uh, in little, uh, you know, those clear bags. Yep. I've been putting them together and they're in, I actually have them in boxes because I just recently had them photographed and that's why I wanted to show you this page. Yeah. yeah. They're, oh. they're to scale. So each square is the same size, so you can see the relationship in the sizes um, through this grid. Um, um, <laughs> Princess is telling me to say the price range. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you should say that i gave it to you princess <laughs> i think i think it's on the agenda but i don't have the agenda up i believe the price range is 500 to a thousand right yeah yes 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 so if anyone's interested um karina's web link is also in the agenda and um you can contact her directly thank you thank you yeah it's been it's been a fun uh project to be part of and I continue to work on um, right now you're going to be the first to see this this is two people send me two different things this is the netty from a, I never remember that sport uh, and I should know this princess because we have it here the one that we play in the spring the lacrosse lacrosse yeah so this is a lacrosse net that was like this and a friend sent me this uh, embroidery threads. Mm. So I have already crocheted the, the strings to go in the ears. And this is web. And now crocheting the back of it. So it's going to be kind of like a, I don't nice. know, like a tall hat. <laughs> so yes. you're the first ones to see this, that it's not completely done. So I, I continue to cover myself, which, as I said, I'm an introvert. So it's hard for me to, to get out there. So when I'm out there, I try to cover myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, and another thing that is fascinating to me too, is to, to see your process, how, as you said, you didn't know what you were gonna do. How are you gonna change this that you were doing? What, how are you gonna deal with it? And I think that's one of the greatest things about being one, um, an artist, but also I think being a female artist allows you a lot more freedom to actually react like that. And I say that only because I was raised uh, having gone to Pratt Institute in the 70s. And when we were told that you had to find what you do and just do it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And that was your thing you did. And the freedom to be able to just react to what's happening around you and create these beautiful masks is just wonderful to watch. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and now I'm even working on my, um, on my thesis show, which is coming in January. Well, hopefully it might not come in January, yeah. <laughs> but uh, because we might be online still, but um, if I'm able to, to exhibit it, one of the ideas that I have come with, which I'm, I need to now make more mass for is to create kind of like a room uh, where people can go in and the mass are hanging all around you. So you're kind of like inside the mass, mm -hmm. all the mass, you know, hanging from, from ceiling to floor. 
and all around you. Yeah. I think, uh, and that they move so that you can see both sides, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's that's the idea that I'm being cooking right now in my brain. <laughs> so let's yeah. see how it turns out. But that's that might be the the way they're going to be presented to the public. Great. Great. Yeah. Why don't you say what your Instagram um, name is? Oh, it's just Karina. Mm -hmm. It's J U S T C O R I N A underscore studio. Okay. Yeah. One other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, working through um, traditionally considered female crafts has an advantage in the way that every culture has some kind of handcraft. Mm -hmm. um, and even though there, there are some variations, the basic is pretty much the same. So even though I'm talking about my own culture, my own upbringing, people can relate to the work I do because they have the same uh, kind of tradition within their own culture so they can add to my work that way. All right. Thank you so much, Karina. Thank you, Susan. Thank, Thank you, Solomon. Happy birthday. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, Greg, did you want to close us out? Yes, close it. I think he's going to do it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, finally. Uh, this was a wonderful show. Oh, yes. We got through it without a hitch, thanks to uh, both of you, Margot and Princess. They notice has gone out for dues. And I, I'd like you to be as generous as you can because we're going to be facing some hardships this year. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know that Nancy Scanlon is here in listening and we have a challenge because the Yale libraries are closed and that means that we are going to uh, miss out on some <coughs> new payments from various people who pay to use a library. So please pay your dues and if you can please put a few dollars into our endowment fund. I'm making that plea on behalf of Nancy. Mike, do you have any final words? Nope, you're muted. Mike, unmute. My audio. Uh, yes, I thought this was a great show and I think what we, what I'm really amazed at how um, we've taken so many different disciplines uh, and put them together uh, uh, in a way which uh, which shows what kind of interests we all have and what we what we uh, what we this is what the Connecticut Academy is for. Uh, I'm sh I'm sorry that we can't have a bigger audience this way, but I'm, I, I think there are ways for us to do that and we'll have to look into it. But this is, is, this is great. Thank you all. Oh, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for doing it. It was wonderful. Thank you for having me. Yep. Thank you for having me too. Thank you all. I'm not going to end the meeting as of yet. I don't know if anyone wants to chat, but, um, I am so glad to be here and glad that we could all do this. We bring art to our screens and we make it work even through a pandemic. Um, I would like to say um, that, you know, reading the past um, of our founding fathers of CAST, one of the things that they really wanted us to do was to know that this was a society of freedom for people to be free to express. And I think that um, we're, we're headed to keeping that promise of the vision of our founding fathers. And um, I want to also just welcome in our new members again, Princess Dr. Lisa, 
and Heidi, who's not on tonight, or she may be, because we have to remember there are times that people can call in and they may be listening on the phone. So we don't really know our count, but I think it was a wonderful meeting. And thank you so much for everyone just trying their best to, you know, get this done. And, and we thank you for all the support. Thank you. Right. Well, good night and bon appetit all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.